so what are we going to talk about in in this week's uh, class? Um, here's an outline. Uh, so I'm going to start by uh, talking about incidence results and uh, their connection to invariant theory. And that will lead us to two algebraic objects, the bracket ring and the grassmann cayley algebra. And I'll talk about their relationship and um, how they come up and arise in um, rigidity theory. Uh, all the main kind of part of the talk today will be on pure conditions of uh, planar frameworks um, that uh, admit motions when they're in special position. So uh, I'll say a lot more about that. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about um, uh, how pure conditions behave under projections in zero Henneberg nodes. And I'm hoping that we get to that uh, point uh, by the end of today, but it's possible that we, that we won't. Um, but in any case, uh, in the continuation, we'll talk about uh, pure conditions of spatial frameworks. So by that, I mean frameworks in three dimensions. Um, where I'll do some examples. And um, then we'll uh, also talk about Wu's method to prove geometric statements. Um, and uh, there I'll draw a connection between a theorem uh, due to uh, Walter Whiteley and Baron Sternfels um, and, uh, and how that connects up with Wu's method. Okay, so. Um, let me start by talking a little bit about incidence geometry. And please, um, if you have a question or, um, or any comment, uh, please just speak up. Uh, I'm not so great at following the chat uh, right now. So, um, or if you put something in the chat, maybe Mira can, can interrupt me and tell me to look there. Uh, all right, um, so let me say something about incidence geometry. Um, and just connect it so uh, with what we've been talking about. Uh, we've been discussing uh, which distances between vertices of a, of a graph are known um, given distances on the edges, right? That's one of the things that, that we talked about, um, how to, um, given uh, distance constraints on the edges of a graph, what, uh, what other information can you infer uh, from the fact that your graph is embedded in some metric space, for instance, right? Um, and um, I'd like to shift the conversation slightly um, to focus on uh, replacing distances by incidence. So uh, by that, I'm gonna focus on which incidences are determined by other known incidences. And here's an example, kind of the prototypical example um, of what I mean. Uh, shown here in the bottom right, um, let's take uh, two blue lines and three points on, the two blue, on each of the two blue lines and join uh, those points up uh, in this way. In fact, there's um, these uh, points are joined up in a kind of hexagon formation. If you trace here, I, can you see my, my little hand icon? You go from one to six, two to four, to three, to five, and back to yeah, one. Yeah, we can see that. Excellent. Then you um, then you trace out a hexagon. Okay, it's true that the hexagon six-sided figure crosses itself. It's somehow degenerate in a certain way. But we trace out that hexagon. And if you um, if you identify opposite edges of the hexagon, meaning edges that like edges one and four, and two and five, and three and six, right? Um, if if you if you uh, intersect those edges sorry, uh, not identify them, but intersect them, you, you get um, three new points of intersection, which I've called seven, eight, and nine here. And what's true about those three new points is that they always are collinear. So in this sense, this uh, sequence of eight collinearities, um, the two blue collinearities and the um, six, black collinearities um, imply this ninth red collinearity. And this is uh, known as Pappas's theorem. It was known um, 
to uh, the um, Egyptian uh, um, mathematician Pappas um, in 340. So, and but it was probably known much earlier than that because his his book, the synagogue, is really a collection of um, interesting uh, mathematical facts that were known. It was kind of like an encyclopedia of geometry. Um, and it's one of the ways that, that we know uh, how to, uh, some of the things um, that were done in Greek geometry uh, prior to that. Um, and the synagogue is, is, uh, is a phrase. Um, it, of course, refers in some ways to a, to a Jewish temple, but in, in other, in a kind of more uh, kind of abstract setting, it, it refers to a collection. In the, in either a collection of individuals in the temple setting, or in this case, a collection of mathematical facts. Um, and if you'd like uh, to get a very nice proof of uh, Pappas's theorem, there's in fact, I think, nine proofs of Pappas's theorem in the first chapter of Jürgen and Peter de Berg's beautiful book, Projectives on Projective Geometry, um, which I have highly recommend. Um, Right. Or if you don't want to read uh, Jurgen's book, but you do want an overview of what's in it, you could look uh, in the Math Monthly, um, where I wrote about a five-page um, book review of it. All right. So um, you might think incidence geometry only has to do with lines and points, and in some sense, that's that's kind of right. Um, but, uh, but those lines and point uh, considerations um, actually can tell you quite a lot. Um, they can tell you uh, also about curved objects. So um, for instance, um, Blaise Pascal, when he was 16 years old, um, he uh, proved a generalization of Pappas's theorem where he replaced the two blue lines in the last picture with a single conic, with a single degree two curve, right? Either an ellipse, maybe a hyperbola. Um, and the two uh, blue lines, of course, are a degenerate conic, um, reducible conic. And, uh, and um, so he, he noticed that uh, the same theorem holds if the two blue lines are replaced by, by an irreducible conic. And that's a nice observation. Um, uh, in this direction, it was uh, of the of the result. He was showing that if the six points lie in a conic, then these three auxiliary points must be collinear, and um, and this result has been rediscovered many many times. Um, uh, there's a famous theorem in uh, algebraic geometry called the eight implies nine theorem, which says that if you have two cubics that intersect in, um, of course, they have to intersect in nine points. Then uh, if you have a third cubic that goes through um, eight of the nine points, then it has to go through the ninth point of intersection as well. And here the two cubics are the set, sum of the sets of lines. So if you take the lines one, one um, uh, lines do I want? Um, every other line, one, three, and five, and two, four, and six, uh, three lines make up a cubic. So, so you get um, one cubic from that and, and uh, a second cubic for the other black lines. And they intersect in nine points. And you can see all nine points here in the picture. Um, and uh, where's the third cubic, the one that's supposed to go through eight of them, We'll take the union of the blue line, the blue conic, and the red line. And that red line, say, going through seven and eight, it, um, it goes through two, and the blue line goes through uh, six. So, so this, this uh, degree three curve goes through eight of the points, so it has to go through the ninth point of intersection as well. And, and that's what this. Um, the, that's an illustration of the eight implies nine theorem in this, in this instance. Um, so uh, Pascal proved uh, this direction and then Breckenridge and McLaurin, two uh, 
mathematicians in the United Kingdom, they uh, proved um, the converse direction about 100 years later, um, that if these three points lie on, uh, on a line, then the other six points have to lie on a line. Uh, right, so, uh, so the point here is that you get uh, statements about uh, conics uh, directly from statements about incidence of lines, right? And, uh, and so incidences of lines are really kind of an important um, uh, way to get access to geometric facts. Sometimes Pascal's uh, theorem is, is called a, a, the mystic hexagon theorem. Um, and uh, I wanted just to point out why it's called mystic. Um, like what's magical or mystical about it? And um, I thought about this for a while. I don't know the actual reason um, why some people called it that, but here's my guess. Um, if the uh, six points um, are uh, lie on a circle and they form uh, the vertices of a regular hexagon, um, then uh, when you look at, at the edge of the uh, six points, they're, they're obviously on a conic. So the, the opposite sides have to intersect in uh, points and they have to uh, lie in a line, right? And so here's two pair, the two opposite sides and they have to intersect somewhere, but they're parallel lines. So they maybe intersect off at infinity. And these other two lines are also parallel. So they have to intersect off at infinity. And, and finally, the third set. So what we find is that, um, is that the three points that uh, we're supposed to obtain have to, uh, have to lie at infinity. Um, and so that means that, uh, that there's a line at infinity um, going through all those three points, right? Um, which maybe isn't so obvious when you're just starting to think about um, compactifications of a projective plane or uh, compactifications of, of the regular plane. Um, it's not so obvious that you have a whole line at infinity or that there's some kind of linear structure to that, those infinite points. And, um, and I think that's uh, maybe why it's called mystic is because it's giving you information about something that normally uh, lies outside of the uh, Euclidean plane that we look at. Um, but for most of the rest of the talk, I'll, um, I'll want to be talking about the projective plane. Um, and so let me say a few words about that as well. Uh, first of all, uh, the projective plane, I'll remind you, is compact. And uh, because of that, um, we uh, have a theorem that's credited to um, uh, Bezu, French mathematician, um, but actually in, this, in the form that I'm gonna state it uh, is, uh, is already in Newton and Kipia. Um, so uh, Bezu noticed that any two curves uh, without common components um, defined by the vanishing of polynomials of two degrees, say D1 and D2, then they have to meet in D1 times D2 points in Q2. Um, but you have to interpret the, the, those points suitably. So uh, I'll try to explain a little bit about that. We've already uh, seen this a little bit. I, I mentioned that uh, two cubics meet in uh, nine points. Two degree three curves should meet in three times three points. Um, here's a, a simpler example. Maybe it's got a, a degree two curve, an ellipse, and it's got a bunch of degree one curves. Um, when we look at this uh, curve y equals zero, we see that it hits the um, degree two curve in two points. And that's what we expect from Bezu's theorem, right? Uh, uh, degree two and degree one should meet in two times one points. But as we slide this line upwards, uh, the two points uh, of intersection move. And eventually we slide the line up to y equals two where, um, where the two points of intersection uh, come together. You know? And, um, and we'd, we'd still like to call this two points of intersection. So we should um, count the points um, here with multiplicity in some sense. And I'm not gonna go into details about how you would count multiplicity. Um, in fact, that can be a kind of complicated uh, thing. Um, but, uh, 
but the idea is that one should count points with multiplicity um, when required. Um, there's a bit more uh, gymnastics that are required when uh, you slide the line even further up. It looks like this line y equals 3 doesn't meet the ellipse at all. Um, and that would violate Bayes' theorem. So what's going on? Well, um, algebraically, when you plug y equals 3 into this equation and solve, you do get two solutions. Um, uh, it's just that the x-coordinates are, are complex. Um, so you get two uh, distinct uh, complex solutions. So, um, so uh, in our interpretation, we should be um, counting complex solutions. And then finally, um, as we saw in the previous slide, we should also be willing to count solutions at infinity. Um, so sometimes that's required as well. Uh, all right, so um, we'll sometimes uh, potentially use Bazou's theorem, but it's important for us that, um, that the projective plane is compact and has some nice properties like this. Um, so let me just um, try to uh, remind you about uh, the projective plane and some of the, the ways we talk about it. Um, so I'm going to think of the projective plane as a Grassmannian. And since the Grassmannian may, may or may not be something that everybody's familiar with, let me just try to um, give you a brief introduction to Grassmannians. Um, so uh, we're going to define um, the space GKN to be a parameter space that, that uh, so that every point in the parameter space um, uh, designates a k-dimensional subspace of n-dimensional um, of an n-dimensional vector space. Okay, so um, so you can think of GKN if you wish as as just a set of k-dimensional subspaces of n-dimensional space, and um, you might say, well, I know an example of such a set. When I look at the one-dimensional subspaces of uh, three-dimensional space, that's giving me lines through the origin in three-dimensional space. And each line through the origin is a point in projective space, right? A point in the projective plane. So G13 is another another name for G13, then is, is just the projective plane PK. Right? And um, in P2, um, German mathematician Movius um, introduced uh, these um, homogeneous coordinates, and they're quite helpful, of course, um, for us. So, uh, so they say that uh, given a line, um, uh, I'm sorry, a point in P2, it, it can be thought of as a line through the origin in, in three-dimensional space. And of course, that line goes through lots of other points. If it goes through the point x, y, z, um, then you can use x, y, and z as the homogeneous coordinates for the line. Um, and you might say, well, wait a sec. Um, that line went through a lot of points, right? It didn't just go through one point. It went through lots. Um, and, and that's true. Uh, so, so this, um, this uh, single coordinate is not really well defined. Uh, as, as a coordinate for the line. Instead, we get a whole equivalence class of coordinates here. And we make use of the fact that, um, that all the points on the line are scalar multiples of one another, right? Um, that uh, all, like a second point on this line is, is say three times x, three times y, and three times z. Um, so what, uh, what we do is uh, when we look at homogeneous coordinates like this, um, we identify um, uh, any two uh, points with the same homogeneous coordinates, um, or even identify points whose uh, homogeneous coordinates only differ by a scalar multiple, non-zero scalar multiple. Um, and because of, of this identification, um, uh, I and many other authors like to put, um, put these colons between the points instead of commas. Um, that reminds us that it's really the ratio of x to y and x to z and y to z that are uh, the important things to determine the point as opposed to x, y, and z themselves, right? Because of course you could scale the points. 
All right. Um, just a little picture of uh, projective space again. Um, and uh, remember, a uh, point in projective space is something like one of these red lines. It's a line through the origin in free space. Um, and one thing that we often do is we uh, identify uh, a portion of projective space and say that it's the kind of finite part of the plane, a projective plane. And to do that, what we could do is, is we can um, intersect with this plane z equals 1. Um, and we can see that, that almost every line through the origin um, hits this plane z equals 1 at a unique point uh, with the z coordinate, of course, equal to 1. And um, if x, y, 1 is that point, then the coordinates, homogeneous coordinates for this line uh, have the form x, y, 1. Um, and in, in particular, um, the last coordinate is not 0, right? Um, so we can kind of, as long as the last coordinate of a, of a point in projective space is not 0, we could scale it so that, so that the last coordinate is 1. And we're talking about a, a point, a finite point. We can identify uh, these lines with the points in the plane. Okay, So we identified a point x, y, 1, say, with a point x, comma, y. Um, so we sometimes think of, of this big subset of projective space as being the finite part of the projective plane, which is kind of the usual Euclidean plane. And then what's left over? Well, uh, the lines that don't hit the plane. Those lines are parallel to this plane. And so they must be lines um, in the uh, x, y plane themselves. So they're, they're lines that whose point homogeneous coordinates look like this. They've got an x and a y coordinate, but their z coordinate is 0. And we uh, think of those points as points at infinity. Um, there's, uh, in fact, a projective line of such points, as, um, uh, as Pascal pointed out to us. right? Um, and uh, it's, in fact, the line z equals 0. Um, why do we say that those points are at infinity? Um, well, let's just do a little calculation. Here uh, is, I'm tracing out some points here on the uh, on this uh, finite projective uh, part of the projective space. I've got the point 0, y, 1. So let's see, um, it's got a, a, a 0 x coordinate, uh, but it's got uh, y coordinate that's increasing. So the points are kind of going along here um, as y gets larger and larger. And notice that uh, if we scale this point by dividing by y, um, we get the same point, 0, 1, 1 over y. But as y goes to infinity, 1 over y goes to 0. And so you can see that, um, that in the limit, we reach this point, 0, 1, 0. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and uh, and this is one of the points at infinity. And this kind of calculation kind of justifies maybe or explains uh, why uh, we call these points points at infinity, because because they're the point that you reach by by tracking a, a line off to infinity. Okay. Um, so that was just a reminder of some of the uh, notation around. Uh, projective, the projective plane, um, we're going to actually be talking a fair bit about um, another uh, Grassmannian. Um, it's the Grassmannian G24. Um, so this consists of two-dimensional subspaces and four-dimensional space. Um, so uh, one-dimensional subspaces and four-dimensional space would just be uh, three, uh, P3, would just be uh, three-dimensional space. And if you've got a two-dimensional subspace in C4, then that corresponds to a, to a line in free space. So we're talking about lines in free space um, use, uh, being parameterized by uh, the Grassmannian G24. Um, and uh, I'd like to try to explain a little bit about how we think about uh, these lines and how what uh, homogeneous coordinates would look like for them, right? Um, so uh, if you've got a two-dimensional subspace and a four-dimensional space, you could uh, pick a basis for it. Um, 
And here I picked uh, two basis vectors and I've written them as rows of a two by four matrix. Okay? And you can say, well, those two basis vectors kind of represent the, um, re represent the two dimensional subspace that we're talking about. Um, and um, notice that if we picked uh, two vectors that were a basis, then this matrix M has to have full rank, right? Um, the, and remember uh, when we looked at um, points in, in P2, we said they're lines through the origin and, and we picked a non-zero point on the line and used it as our, as our uh, homogeneous coordinates, right? Um, that's very similar we were picking to what we're doing here uh, before we were picking a basis vector really xyz right for the line and um, and now we're picking two basis vectors two, two basis vectors right or two vectors in a basis um, and um, before we insisted that um, that the basis vector that we pick um, couldn't couldn't uh, have degenerate rank right at the if you looked at the at the one by three matrix given by that little basis vector, it, it had to have full rank as well. So this is very similar to what we did uh, when we were constructing this projective plane. Um, we're just uh, constructing now a similar kind of thing up in uh, three states. Okay, but um, there's many um, different bases for a given two dimensional subspace. Um, we could have picked a different basis, right? And um, so, so how do the matrices relate to each other if, if they both represent the same subspace? Well, um, it means that uh, if they both represent the sub same subspace, you can do a, a change of coordinates from one to the other. And that change of coordinates um, can be realized by a, um, by a row by row operations. And so there's a, a two by two invertible matrix um, so that uh, A times this M gives you, uh, gives you the other uh, matrix that you're looking at, right? So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's really um, an equivalence class of matrices that correspond to um, to a given subspace, given two-dimensional subspace, and they all differ by uh, multiplication on the left by a um, by an invertible matrix. Um, okay, so so now that we've got these matrices, um, what could we do with them? Well, um, we could uh, take their uh, two by two minors. We could take all the two by two um, uh, mat sub matrices of M and take the determinants. And here there's four uh, columns. So there's four choose two or six, six uh, two by two um, minors. And if we take their uh, two by two minors, there's six of them, we could use those, uh, those minors as the coordinates of a map from our G24, from our, our set of lines in P3 to, um, six dimensional space, right? Uh, so the first uh, coordinate would be x1 times y2 minus x2 times y1. And you would have similar coordinates for, for each of the other, uh, other uh, for all six, right? Um, and this is a map, but it's not a well-defined map because, um, because of course, if you change M, change your matrix representing the line in P3, um, these uh, these numbers change, right? Because um, what what happens? Well, you're taking the determinant. Uh, if you change m uh, by uh, multiplying on the left by an invertible matrix, um, you're going to uh, you're not going to change the actual subspace, but you're going to change these numbers. And in fact, how do these numbers change? They change. Each of them gets multiplied by the determinant of a, which is a non-zero number because because uh, a is invertible. So in fact, uh, the six numbers that, that you're mapping to, um, they're not well-defined, but they're well-defined up to scalar multiples, right? So um, if we wanna make this map well-defined, we can, as long as we pass to a projective five space. Okay? So that's how we make the map well-defined. 
And so we have this map given by the uh, six minors, uh, two by two minors, sending G24 into P5. Okay. And uh, these six coordinates are called the, uh, well, the Kluker coordinates of our Y. So um, let me just say a few more words about G24. Um, you know, it's a, it's a subset of, of P5 once you've embedded it in this way, um, but it's not all of P5. Um, in fact, uh, it's a four-dimensional subset. And I've, I've written down one um, uh, matrix here to show you why, kind of intuitively, why it should be four-dimensional. Um, so uh, why should it be four-dimensional? Well, you could use your row and column operations uh, to produce ones and zeros. And then you would have four uh, kind of remaining values that wouldn't be determined by, by, the, um, uh, by the row operations. You could essentially get any value here. And so this suggests that there's at least a four-dimensional piece of G24. Um, and uh, now of course, it's possible that, that you can't put it into this format, um, but there's, so there's other pieces of G24 as well, um, but it turns out that those other pieces have lower dimension as well. Um, here's another way to think of G24 as being uh, four dimensional. Um, well, G24 is a set of lines in three space. And um, I'm, I'm here in uh, one of my, bedrooms in my house, and um, I can imagine those those lines in three space, and most of those lines hit the ceiling of my room and also hit hit the wall over here, right? Okay, so they hit one of the walls and they hit the ceiling, and on the, on the ceiling they've got uh, two coordinates uh, to say where they hit the ceiling, and on the, one of the walls they have two coordinates to say where they hit that wall. And, um, and so there's four kind of parameters that describe the line. So again, it suggests that, that G24 is a four-dimensional space sitting inside a five-dimensional space, which should be a hyperspace. Huh, should be cut out by a single equation, is what we would expect. Um, and I want to explain what that equation is. Um, so it turns out that um, the minors of M, so this, this sorry, let's go back. We've got our matrix M, a two by four matrix, and we're looking at all these two by two minors of M. And you might think, okay, those are six numbers and they're independent, but in fact, they're not independent. Uh, there's, there's relations among them, among the minors, um, and I'd like to explain that um, to start. So um, we're gonna view the columns of M as four vectors. So it's a bit strange because before we looked at the rows of M, as being the two basis vectors of, of our two-dimensional space, right? But now I'd like to switch perspectives and think of the columns of M. Okay, you could do such a thing. Um, and what I'm going to assume is that uh, V1 and V2 span um, uh, uh, two space, right? Um, uh, if they don't, you could, you could just uh, relabel. But, but let's assume that they span um, uh, two space. And so then uh, V3, for instance, is a linear combination of those two uh, vectors. And to find out which linear combination, we could write down this little system of equations here. We've got V1 and V2 as the two columns here of this matrix. And X and Y are my, are, uh, my uh, um, coefficients of my uh, linear combination. And V3 is the vector I'm trying to uh, write uh, down as a linear combination of uh, V1 and V2. And um, we'll use Cromer's rule. Um, and, um, and Cromer's rule uh, says that if you want to solve this equation, you can do so very easily. You can take uh, V3 and substitute it for V1, and you get a new matrix. Um, uh, with V3 as one column and V2 as the other column, and you can take that two by two uh, determinant and divide it by the two by two determinant of V1 and V2. And here, and then what follows, I'm going to use brackets for determinants. So this says uh, the bracket three, two means take the determinant of the matrix 
um, given by 0.3 and 0.2, or how vector v3 and v2. Um, and so that's x and y is, is similar, uh, but instead you replace uh, v2 with v3, right? And so um, if you if you write uh, v3, then you can write it as this x times v1 plus this x, this y times v2. Um, and if you clear denominators, you get this uh, linear combination, right? Okay. And then uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, I've got these two vectors that are equal, but I've got two of them. And I'm going to plug them into um, uh, to this matrix as the um, first uh, column and have the fourth uh, vector, or V4, be the, the um, second column. And we'll take the uh, two by two determinant, right? And of course, if you plug the same vectors in to, to here, you're going to get the same number coming out. Um, but when you plug in uh, this vector um, using uh, multilinearity of the determinant, you can kind of pull these this constant out, and you just get uh, the determinant 1, 4, v1, v4. And similarly, here you get um, 1, 3 times 2, 4. And then when you plug v3 in here, you get uh, the 3, 4. Okay. So we get this equation. And um, if you move some terms to, to I guess, the right side um, and uh, maybe adjust uh, the determinants so that they look a bit more natural, like 3, 2 is really minus 2, 3, um, uh, then, then you get this equation here. And this is actually the defining equation for G2, 4. Remember, each of these 2 by 2 uh, deter determinants is, a, um, is one of our coordinates in P5, right? So this is saying among the six coordinates for P5, this is the relation that they satisfy. They satisfy a quadratic relation um, uh, given in this way, right? Um, okay, so G24 is a degree two dimension four hypersurface in P5. Okay, it's a kind of complicated statement, but I think we kind of got to it uh, using some basic linear algebra. Um, and uh, and that allows you actually to do all sorts of fun stuff. And uh, I don't want to detour too much, but, uh, but I think this is, this is nice. So uh, I was very impressed uh, by this when I first saw this. Uh, you could ask lots of enumerative problems. Um, you could state lots of enumerative problems. And here's one, probably the most famous uh, of the basic enumerative problems. You could ask, um, how many lines are there that um, meet four given lines in uh, free space. Okay. Um, so first of all, we might say to ourselves, like, well, why should there be any lines that meet four given lines in free space? And the answer is, well, remember that the lines in free space are G24, and we think that they've got uh, the dimension of G24 is four dimensional. And to meet a line in free space, um, for one line to meet a fixed line is a uh, is a co-dimension one condition, um, and uh, let me try to explain why that's the case. Um, but if if I can explain why it's a co-dimension one condition, placing four co-dimension one conditions should cut us down to a, a, a zero-dimensional space, which is a, just a finite collection of uh, of elements of G two four. In that case, it's just a finite collection of lines in free space that, that meet all the other four lines, right? So we're expecting a finite number uh, from this, um, as long as we uh, understand why um, meeting a line is a co-dimension one condition. And here's actually the kind of expression. Um, suppose I've got uh, my line that I'm trying to figure, figure out whether it, it hits um, uh, whether it hits um, the um, the second line, so I've got uh, the top two rows. Let's say are my are my uh, variable line, and the bottom two rows are the uh, are the two basis vectors for the 
there's a line in free space that I um, that I fixed, okay, that I'd like to meet, right? And um, and so we get this matrix, and if you if you do Laplace expansion, not along one row, but along two rows. So it turns out you can do Laplace expansion across more than just one row. Um, and to do that, you take, um, say, this two by two determinant and, and multiply it by this two by two determinant. And then you have to do this for every two by two determinant in the top row, top two rows. So you get like uh, uh, column one and column, let's say three here. Um, and that gets that two by two determinant gets multiplied by uh, column two and column uh, four here. And so you can see the, those determinants here. I've written down uh, the Laplace expansion. And the two lines meet if uh, this determinant is zero because um, they, uh, they only span a three dimensional space, right? Um, the point of intersection and then those two kind of rays sticking out. The point of intersection gives you one dimension, like along uh, the origin up to this point. And then there's these two directions as well. So they define that they uh, when they meet, they they define a three-dimensional space. Um, and so this four by four determinant just vanishes, right? Um, great. Uh, so this expression vanishes um, when uh, the two lines meet. And by this expression, I mean that um, the by these little ones and twos, I mean this is the three, four determinant for the second line. In that case, I think it's the line that we're, um, the, that we're fixing. So these are fixed numbers with the twos and the sub one brackets are, are our variables. So we just get a linear equation, right? So that's what I was saying before. I was saying that there's, um, that there's a co-dimension one uh, constraint to meet a line. And in fact, we know something more now. We know that it's a linear constraint. Ha, huh. okay. So what we're doing is we're trying to intersect um, G24 and these four linear constraints, right? So what's happening? Well, uh, Bazou's theorem tells us um, in P5, you would expect the number of solutions to the system of equations to be the product of the degrees. And so we get, uh, degree two for G24 and degree one for all these four lines. So we should expect two solutions. And, uh, and that's the answer. Um, there are two lines that meet uh, four lines in general position in, the, uh, in free space. Um, and there's a kind of nice um, uh, way to see this. Um, if you to form those two lines, those four lines, so that two of them meet, and and to form the other two, so they meet, then the line that goes through those two points of intersection meets all four lines, right? That's that's obvious. That's one of the two lines. Where's the other two lines? Where's the other one? Well, those two lines, they're meeting. They they um, they span a plane, and these two lines that meet, they span a plane. And so the two planes meet in a line. And that line meets all four lines as well. So those are the two, uh, those are the two lines that hit all four lines in that special case. Um, and a lot of enumerative geometry actually kind of uh, made arguments like this. They would move the lines to special position and then uh, see the answer. And then they would try to argue that the answer doesn't change when you move further. Um, but eventually people got pretty worried about that kind of <laughs> argument. Um, and they were kind of unsure about a lot of things like, well, why, why do the numbers not change when you move? And why exactly um, can you just count the numbers? What about multiplicity? Like, are you missing something? And, uh, and then Hilbert asked as one of as the 15th Hilbert problem, you know, to make this calculus of uh, enumeration uh, uh, rigorous. And essentially it was achieved um, using 
called Schubert Calculus. Um, so it's one of the successful stories from the Hilbert problem. Um, okay. Uh, okay, we did moved a little bit to enumerative things, but we're going to use G24 a lot, so I think it's it's helpful to to play with it a little bit now. Um, okay, maybe this is a little overkill, but um, but it it suggests something. So here's a nice theorem due to Neil White, um, and you know when you know that there's four that uh, that every um, set of four lines is hit by two lines, you might ask, well, what sets of five lines are hit by, by a line, right? Like normally you would say, no, five lines don't get hit by any line, but maybe if the five lines were in special enough position, they would get hit by, by, by another line. Um, um, when, when one line hits a bunch of others, you call it a transversal. So Neil asked, um, uh, for which sets of five lines does there exist a transversal? And um, what's clear is that this is um, independent of the choice of coordinates that you put on free space. It doesn't really matter what your choice of coordinates is. Um, so this turns out to be a problem in invariant theory. And, um, and his answer was um, it, the five lines have a transversal if this determinant vanishes. And this determinant is a determinant with brackets as the entries. And these, each of these brackets is a four by four determinant, right? Um, each of these points, A1, B1, et cetera, are in free space, free space, projective free space. So they're, they're vectors with four entries. And, um, and so these are four by four matrices that we're taking the determinant for. Um, so it's a determinant of determinants. And in the 19th century, there were many mathematicians who were intimately familiar with all of the calculus of determinants of determinants. Um, they do amazing things in their papers. Folks like Cayley and uh, Salman and all these in, impressive geometers um, do uh, some, some just phenomenal calculations of these kinds of things. But, uh, but a lot of that kind of fell out of fashion when um, Hilbert uh, introduced abstract algebra um, and uh, some non-constructive techniques that were very powerful. And only in the last, I don't know, 40 or 50 years um, that, uh, that we've kind of come back to these constructive techniques. And now, of course, we can use computers to help us um, do these calculations. Um, and th that means that, um, that sometimes these constructive techniques are very useful. Um, so anyway, this is, this is an example of some of the kinds of things we're going to be talking about. All right, so th that was a bit of an, a kind of segue to invariant theory. Um, uh, invariant theory got a big um, boost uh, although it had been going strong for, for many years um, prior to this, but in 1872, um, uh, Felix Klein uh, introduced a kind of program to axiomatize and understand geometries. Um, and it's called the Erlangen program, I think in honor of where he spoke when he, uh, when he was talking about this. Um, but he wanted to characterize geometries by which properties uh, are invariant under a group of transformations. So for instance, Euclidean geometry, the things that are invariant are, um, are statements or kind of quantities that are, um, uh, that are not changed by distance preserving transformations. So, um, You've got a distance preserving transformation like a rotation or a translation then um, then you can talk about um, you've got a property sorry that's not that's not uh, changed by such things and you can say that it's invariant right um, and uh, similar to that um, uh, if a property is not changed um, under a change of basis 
then you could say that it's a projective property. Okay? So um, change of basis has the same kind of role in projective geometry that are uh, distance preserving transformations like rotation and, and translation have in Euclidean geometry. And so often we'll be talking about projective transformations, but sometimes we'll also want to talk about Euclidean. Um, so uh, Klein really wanted to um, wanted to say that these geometries were were distinct, and at least I think he over he, he overstretched the analogy a little bit uh, at the beginning, um, and um, at the beginning he really wanted to say like in projective geometry there's there's no notion of distance, and I've heard this said many times, but in fact it's not true. Um, you can you can measure distances in projective geometry um, appropriately done, and if you look in Mr. Gebert's book, it's done there. Um, and uh, and this was known, in fact, Laguerre knew it long before uh, Klein, and I, I, and and Klein knew it too. <laughs> so I think he was just uh, stretching a little bit the analogy. Um, and in fact, um, when he came to write up his Erlangen program, um, if you if you look up the reference for Klein's program, it's usually um, given as this memorial address that he gave to the American Math Society in the early 1900s, I think it was 1904. Um, and at that point already, he'd, he'd kind of backed off some of the statements that he'd made earlier. And he acknowledged that, yeah, of course you can measure distance in projective geometry, it's just not as important, which is probably true. Um, okay. Um, so uh, we're going to spend a lot of time working with, with brackets. And, um, and I want to uh, use a very similar argument to what we worked on before um, to, uh, um, to describe why brackets are invariant. Um, so uh, you know, we can use a change of basis, uh, uh, an invertible three by three matrix, um, and act on P2 using that change of basis. So you could take a three vector and, and multiply it on the left and you get a new three vector. And we'll, we'll view that as, as a change of basis in this case. And, um, and notice that um, the three points uh, in projective space are collinear if and only if um, they satisfy a linear uh, dependence and that happens if and only if the um, three by three matrix that you get by making the columns um, of the matrix has determinant zero. Okay. Um, so uh, here's uh, here we're showing that if you have uh, if you want to measure collinearity, you can do it using one of our determinants, one of our brackets. Um, and I'd like to um, remark that that um, vanishing of the bracket is an invariant. It doesn't depend on our choice of basis. And to see that, notice that if you change uh, our basis, so we multiply P1 by, by A on the left and multiply P2 by A and multiply P3 by A. And, and if we then evaluate the determinant on the transformed um, bracket, right? What do we get? Of course, well, you can pull the determinant out and you get the determinant of A, which is just a non-zero number, um, uh, times the bracket one, two, three that we had before, right? And so these two determinants, since they differ by a non-zero scalar, um, they either, they both vanish at exactly the same time and, and don't vanish at exactly the same time. So it doesn't depend the, the vanishing of this bracket doesn't depend on the basis that we chose, okay? which maybe is kind of obvious uh, because um, after all, collinearity shouldn't depend on the basis either. Um, uh, okay, so um, so these brackets, uh, these three by uh, three by three determinants, they are um, they are invariants uh, of projective space and um, invariants of uh, 
on the change of basis. And we'll see in the next couple slides that um, brackets of on points in P2 um, uh, determine the values of any invariance. Um, so let me just um, say those things, and then maybe we'll take a, a short break. Um, so, uh, all right. Um, so, what are invariants of points in P two? Well, uh, if you had an invariant, something that that um, that doesn't depend on uh, some statement that doesn't depend on uh, your choice of basis, um, you'd say that that uh, that that property is an algebraic property uh, if it's determined by the vanishing of a polynomial. And the property is well defined if every variable appears to the same power in all terms. Otherwise, when you scale uh, your points, um, the the polynomial's values shift. And so that that's that's not good. Um, or at least they shift uh, not in a not by by a scalar. They 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 don't they don't uh, uh, they don't span a one dimensional substrate. They span something higher and, and that's that's a problem. Um, but if you but if you're looking at algebraic well-defined properties, um, uh, what we what we find is uh, is this theorem, the first fundamental theorem of invariant theory, which says that every such algebraic well-defined invariant um, can be written as a polynomial in the bracket. So if you want, we saw before that the brackets themselves were uh, algebraic and well-defined, um, but now we're saying that, that the only things that are invariants are things that can be built as polynomials, well-defined polynomials using these brackets. Um, um, but the brackets themselves are far from being independent, as we've already seen. Um, so we can use Cromer's rule again in three space. So I, I won't spend much time on this slide, but you do exactly the same thing that we did just a moment ago. You put your three, uh, if you've got say four points in um, P2, then you just put uh, three of the points uh, down as columns. And let's imagine that those three points span uh, all, of, all of three space. Um, and then you write the fourth point as a linear combination of those. And you can use Cromer's rule to uh, find explicitly what the coefficients of this linear combination are. Um, and then you can substitute the two sides of this equation, their vectors, into um, this bracket um, as the first column. And the second and third columns are the fourth, or a fourth point and a fifth point in projective space. And after doing a little bit of uh, rearranging, you get this equation. Notice that when you plug this uh, point in to this bracket, you would get a determinant that's a four, four, five. And since the two columns are repeated, you get zero, right? Um, so on the, on the right-hand side, we get zero. And on the left-hand side, we get, um, we, we get precisely this. Um, for instance, you get one, four, five uh, coming from, from this P1 substituted in. And you get the other terms too. Um, and again, you get this kind of quadratic relation, and and these quadratic relations are are super important. Um, you can kind of build them uh, up uh, in lots of different ways, um, but these relations, like the one that we just defined, um, uh, are called grassmann plucker relations, and all these relations uh, that come from Cromer's rule are are um, uh, generate, in fact, uh, the relations among all the brackets. And that's the uh, statement of the second fundamental theorem of invariant theory that uh, that describes all the relations on the brackets. And of course, if you've got a first and a second theorem, you've got to ask, like, well, what's the third theorem of invariant theory? And that's lot, uh, much less known, um, but essentially, you would expect that to be relations on the relations, right? So you'd start looking at, um, at uh, resolutions, homological resolutions of, um, of a ring of invariants. 
we're not going to go there, but um, it's kind of amusing. Um, and it's important. So this this um, ring of of brackets, um, ring of these uh, brackets uh, representing determinants, um, is uh, is an algebra. Allows you, you can multiply brackets, you can add them, and things like that. You can break down polynomials in them. Um, uh, but of course, uh, we have these relations among the brackets, so it's not it's not a polynomial ring uh, in these brackets. It's it's got it's a, it's an algebra with relations. We're introducing some relations, and we call that algebra the bracket algebra. And it models two different things that are both important to us. In some sense, it models uh, it's the coordinate ring for um, the uh, Grassmannian of k planes in it, k spaces in n space, but it's also um, uh, the uh, represents the invariance of endpoints in um, in of p k minus one, in, in uh, and we saw that here when we took um, uh, when we took k equals three, and and we had um, we had each point each column be thought of as a as a point in um, in, in P2. Um, so when you kind of think of this bracket algebra in terms of the columns, you're thinking of it as a ring of invariance of a collection of points. And when you're thinking about it in terms of rows, you're thinking about it in terms of the Grassmannian, uh, defining uh, equations for Grassmannian. So there's these kind of two dual notions and and that um, is both incredibly rich and also sometimes slightly frustrating because um, sometimes you you can be thinking about things in just the wrong direction okay um, that's uh, what I want to stop on for now um, we've been going for 65 minutes but let's just take a five minute break if that's okay um, and uh, I'll take any questions. You can relax for a moment and we'll come back at 11.10 and start again. Mira and I were, were um, talking before the start of the seminar as well that, um, that one of the difficulties in uh, this class is that um, we're all at our home institutions as well, or even just at home, and we all have um, have other responsibilities and other things that uh, keep interfering with our uh, ability to pay attention to these lectures and follow them. And um, that's kind of, uh, it, it kind of makes it unfortunate in some ways. I, I, I actually really value um, the interchange with uh, seminar participants and, um, and it, it's kind of unfortunate that uh, that the online format and more importantly, the kind of distance that everybody has uh, makes it tricky to pay attention, I think. Um, Hi. Uh, I was wondering, I don't know if this is the second half of your talk, uh, but if you could say anything on the uh, bracket algebra, like anything more on the bracket algebra. Because uh, there's some um, interplay between it and the uh, Grassmann Cayley algebra. Yeah. But I don't fully understand the difference between the two. Right. And yeah. And perhaps just uh, uh, outline perhaps a distinction between them. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll we'll definitely talk about this. It's a um, the bracket algebra um, is get get this right here. Um, it's it's a bigger algebra than the grassmann cayley algebra. So in some sense, the Grassmann, uh, so the bracket algebra 
um, has inside of it a somewhat smaller algebra called the grassmann Thule algebra. And, um, and, and uh, that algebra, the grassmann Thule algebra, um, kind of expresses geometry of linear spaces very nicely. Um, so how, if you want to describe a line ne needing a plane or something like that and a point, and um, then the grassmann Cayley algebra allows you to kind of write down expressions that somehow uh, encode that precisely. Um, and this is like joins and meets. That's and, joins and meets. Yeah. And we're gonna we're gonna introduce that too. Yeah. So so that's the um, that's a kind of it turns out that's a subalgebra of the bracket algebra. Um, every uh, expression in in uh, the Grassmann Cayley algebra uh, of a certain step. So I have to be a bit careful, but. Roughly speaking, every invariant expression that you're interested in can be um, uh, can be written out as a bracket and be kind of expanded into a bracket uh, polynomial. Um, but we'll see later, maybe on Thursday actually, that not every uh, bracket polynomial uh, can be expanded as a uh, in a Grassmann-Cayley expression and um, and, uh, and yet the two things are very closely related. Um, essentially, uh, I think they have the same dimension. So one's, one's slightly bigger, but not much bigger. Okay, that's, that makes sense. that's kind of weird, I'm um, saying the dimension, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So like, I always get the, then the wrong way around in my head, but like a line being contained in a plane uh, would be a bracket equal to zero, right? That's, right? that's right. And that would be a join in the grassman Cayley. No, the, yeah, the grassman Cayley on, or a meet. You could do that as a join. Um, yeah. You could say, um, because you would expect a, a line and a plane usually to span a bigger space, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and when they fail to span such a bigger space, their join would be zero. Mm -hmm. So you could kind of detect that, that failure by, um, and, and in particular, you could detect the geometric condition that the line is contained in the plane by, by seeing that their join is zero. Yeah, and so like, Perhaps this is the way I sort of thought of it before, and you can maybe correct me, correct me if I'm wrong. Like a join in the Grassmann Cayley algebra is a, a sort of like a bracket, and then there are these uh, some. I th this is referring to the, I think, Neil White's chapter in a handbook, which I think probably read. Uh, he writes it as <laughs> precisely that one, yeah. Uh, he he writes it as, uh, I think, a sum of like brackets with permuted elements. Yes, we'll come to this and, as well. Yes, the okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. So hold on to this question, but it's a great one. It's a, it's a one that, that kind of leads us into um, into the things we want to talk about for sure. Okay. Cool. Uh, all right. Just one quick last question. Yeah, sure. Uh, by invariant, do we mean like uh, invariant under a projective transformation or or, or what? Yeah. yeah. Uh, invariant under a projective transformation um, or, or more generally just a, a change of a coordinate. Oh, okay. So that would be the change of basis matrix when you're talking about brackets. Okay, exactly. I just think I think I missed that bit of your uh, okay, definition. Yeah, you definitely did I define it. it, but didn't write it. Um, yeah. Uh, in Austin, yeah. If you've got a property um, that doesn't depend on on you know your choice of basis, then that's an invariant. For instance, if you had six points in the plane 
and you wanted to know, do they all lie on a, on a conic or not? It doesn't matter what, what basis you choose. It's not like that's, that answer is going to change if you were in a certain basis and then another one. Okay, the yeah. conic itself, the equation of the conic would change, but the, but the property of lying on a conic doesn't matter. And so that's an invariant property. And it should be expressed as a bracket polynomial. And okay, we, thank you. And in fact, we're going to see one of those soon. All right. Maybe. In fact, possibly right now. Right now, in fact. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> cool. Thank you. Cool. Uh, no, thanks for the question. Um, so, we're actually going to look at exactly this question that we were just chatting about. Um, when does six points lie in a conic? And I mean, we know uh, an answer, essentially, uh, Pascal gave an answer, right? He said, okay, when these three other residual points um, are collinear. Um, uh, but I want to come back to this um, using a Grassmann Kluker relation. So here's the Grassmann Kluker relation um, that I'm looking at. Um, but if some of these points are collinear, I, uh, let's imagine, which points do I say? Three, four, five. If uh, if uh, points three, four, and five are collinear, then this bracket vanishes, right? It's zero. So, so this term goes away, and you just get an equality of these two uh, bracket monomials, right? So that these two bracket monomials are, are equal whenever um, some third term is, is zero. Um, so what could we do with this? Well, together with Pascal's theorem, we can say, um, what has to happen bracket-wise when um, we have a bunch of collinearities? So for instance, what happens when all the collinearities, all the incidences are, of Pascal's theorem are, are satisfied? Well, um, then the points seven, eight, and nine are collinear, right? That was the conclusion of Pascal's theorem. So that turns out to imply this equality of bracket monomials. And, and a bunch of other uh, it incidences tell you uh, equality of a bunch more uh, bracket monomials. Sometimes they have a sign in front of them, depending on, on uh, which thing you're canceling. But, but roughly speaking, you get these. And now here's the great thing. <laughs> awesome. We're going to multiply all of these brackets on the left and all of the brackets on the right to get two equal uh, bracket polynomials, right? And then we're going to cancel all of the black brackets. All of the black brackets have a counterpart on both sides of the equation. For instance, 597 must appear here somewhere and it appears here. So these two brackets could cancel. And all that's left are these um, four red brackets on the left side, and these four red brackets on the right side. If you check the signs, they multiply to plus. And so what we find is that if, if you satisfy the conditions for uh, Pascal's theorem, that is, if you lie on a conic, then this equality must hold uh, among the brackets. So this, um, this bracket equation, or you could make it a bracket polynomial by moving this over to the other side, um, this, this bracket equation tells you um, when six points lie in a conic. Um, and uh, and that, that's an example of a bracket polynomial telling you something about, the, uh, about an invariant property. It's a cool trick. I call this a binomial proof. And um, there's a lot of very beautiful uh, things that can be proved with binomial proofs. Um, all right. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, what we were just mentioning, the grassmann cayley algebra. Um, so the grassmann cayley algebra is a sub-algebra of the bracket algebra, but it looks very different. Um, so uh, let me try to explain. Um, so the grassmann cayley algebra, which I'll abbreviate GC algebra, is essentially the exterior, exterior algebra on an n plus one dimensional vector space. Um, but um, an exterior algebra, you'll remember on a vector space, you, you're allowed to take uh, the wedge product of a bunch of vectors, and uh, those wedge products determine 
um, differential forms, essentially. Uh, and um, uh, it's an alternating product, etc. Um, but uh, we're going to introduce two new operations on the uh, on the exterior algebra, um, and those two operations are going to be called the join and the meet. And uh, so let me say just a few more words about the exterior algebra, how I'm thinking about it. Um, I'm thinking that the exterior algebra is made of a bunch of pieces, graded pieces. It's the direct sum of graded pieces. And, um, and the deep graded piece is the vector space that's spanned by the wedge product of D vectors in uh, our vector space. So, um, so the, uh, the first graded piece just has, is just the vector space V itself. It's just spanned by one uh, by copies of one vector. Um, uh, and the second um, graded piece has V1 wedge V2, and, and um, where you're allowed to have anything, any vectors V1 and V2 picked from V, right? So you get uh, the second wedge space of, of your vector space, and et cetera. It goes on all the way up to um, the uh, dimension of your vector space, where um, where you'll get um, uh, a wedge product of all the vectors. Um, uh, that doesn't make sense. A wedge product of the of the of all of a bunch of basis vectors would be would be a uh, would be a, a representative for that um, that for that graded piece. Um, it's a one dimensional graded piece. Um, and um, Giancarlo Rota uh, introduced some notation for the Grassmann KA algebra um, and popularized its use tremendously. Um, he uh, did something unfortunate, I think, but kind of uh, I'll try to explain why I think it's it's helpful. Um, he replaced the usual wedge symbol <laughs> with the upside down wedge symbol, <laughs> with the V symbol. Okay, and he called that the join. And I guess when I think of the join, I, I think of it almost like a, a union, a cup, right, in, in LaTeX. And, and so the join uh, here um, is, is given the, a similar symbol to the cup. Um, so what is the join? The join is just, uh, in some sense, it's just the exterior um, you know, product. You're just using the wedge the wedge, but we're just calling it uh, by a different name. Um, but uh, let me try to explain why we call it the join. Um, first, I should mention what the support of, of uh, an extensor is. So first, what's an extensor? An extensor is just a, um, a wedge product of vectors in, um, in your vector space V. So you might say, well, that's everything, right? Everything in E is a wedge product of vectors. And that's not quite true. Um, the things in E are, are sums, like linear combinations of wedge products, right? Um, so, uh, so it's kind of like having a single kind of component um, uh, rather than having a sum of different components, right? So an extensor you should think of as a single component. Um, and, and an extensor uh, like this, uh, which is the join of a bunch of vectors, is the span of those vectors. So the support of an extensor is the span of the vectors that you're, that you're joining together. And so in some sense, if you think of span as, as being like a union, where you're kind of building something bigger, then, um, then uh, this, uh, Calling these things the join, I think um, it's kind of helpful in that sense. Um, and we often, because these things are so confusing, um, we often drop the v's and we'll just write uh, the vectors side by side. Um, and so this this is supposed to represent um, the uh, the join of vectors v1 through v, and um, and they're um, and uh, and this 
uh, extensor has span given by the vectors v1 through v1. Um, and um, if you take the span of n plus 1 vectors, or you take the join of n plus 1 vectors, what you're doing is you're taking the alternating product of n plus 1 vectors and an alternating product of um, vectors in an n plus 1 dimensional vector space with n plus 1 vectors. You can think of that as the determinant of an n plus 1 by n plus 1 um, square matrix, right? And so that determinant is a bracket. So you can see that, at, um, that uh, in some sense, uh, when you've got uh, something um, uh, in the n plus 1 piece, graded piece here, uh, of E, um, uh, you're getting uh, sums of such things. And so you're getting actual brackets. And before I said that the, uh, the grassman cayley algebra um, is a sub algebra of the bracket algebra. And, I, and now I, I should take that back. That's kind of not quite right. That's not quite true. Um, it's that uh, the n plus one dimensional piece of the Grassmann Cayley algebra is a sub algebra. And that's the one that we actually often care about. But, um, but I guess the Grassmann Cayley algebra somehow um, has more things, right? It's got more graded pieces, and those aren't subalgebras of the of the uh, bracket algebra. So I'd say that I misspoke there. Um, so, um, okay, well, what do we do when we've got two extensors? Like, um, if you've got an extensor uh, like this one, join of, of vectors x1 through xk, you've got another extensor, a join of vectors y1 through yl, um, then uh, how do we take their union? Well, you just take their union by, by taking this wedge product and wedging it with this wedge product. So that's very easy. Um, but, uh, and so that's what we call, call their the support of their join. So that's the join of, two, of these two extensors is the, it's the wedge product, right? Um, and uh, the support of their join is the span of their supports, right? Um, but like we were just talking about before, if you had one of the extensors representing um, the join of say two points, which is the line, right? Um, and another extensor representing the join of three points, which is a plane. Um, and if the line lies in the plane, then when you take the, um, when you take the wedge product, Right? When you take the join, when you're supposed to wedge all these vectors together, um, you, you get zero because uh, the vectors are, are dependent, right? It's a dependency among them. And, um, and so uh, the support of the join of two extensors is uh, the span of their supports if the vectors are independent. And if they're not independent, then you get zero. So that's, that's a it's a kind of more complicated thing, but you can, but you essentially detect dependence using um, using the join from the other side. Okay, so I mentioned that, that we have the join um, and, and that we're also gonna define the meet. Up till now, I, I've just been talking about a somewhat more complicated way of writing um, the, uh, the wedge product. So we haven't actually done anything new. Um, but we've given it something a new name. Let's talk about the meet. Um, so if you've got, again, extensors uh, x1 through xk, so the join of k points, the join of l points. Um, and if k plus l is already uh, at least the size of your uh, ambient vector space, then uh, we can define what's called the meet. And the meet is a somewhat complicated object. Um, uh, how to say this. Uh, so um, you take y1 through yl and you put some of the points in x, you put them at the front of, uh, of y1 through yl in a, you pick enough of them in order to make a bracket. Okay, so I guess we have to have n plus one of them here. Um, 
and then uh, you leave the rest as just a uh, join. And then you uh, take a, uh, a sum, a uh, signed sum over all uh, such uh, brackets that you could make. Um, but, this, but the permutation that you're, you're allowed to use is a little bit complicated. You're only allowed to, um, to use what's called a shuffle permutation. So you're allowed to, to pick some of these points, x1 through xk, but what we want is to preserve the order of the points. So if I pick uh, one and three, I, I want these guys to be one and three here. I don't want them to be three and one, although normally a permutation would be allowed to flip the order like that. Here we want to kind of maintain the order amongst these uh, things that we've picked to put into here, and we want to maintain the order over here as well. So, um, and, uh, and the sign is just going to uh, tell us if you um, if you have these uh, x's and you put them next to these x's um, and you want to reorder them to give x1 through xk, uh, what's the sign of the permutation, plus or minus one, right, uh, that you have to use. So we'll see this in, in a bunch of examples and, and it'll become a bit more familiar. Um, but uh, it's a somewhat complicated notion of like what's the meat. And uh, several years ago, uh, Louis Duran and Jessica Sidman and I were, uh, were sitting around talking and, and this topic came up. And we said like, why is the meat defined the way it is? <laughs> like, wh why should it be defined this crazy way, right? Um, and uh, eventually we decided that, um, that the reason is uh, that the meet is supposed to be dual to the join operation. That there's a duality that you can uh, define on the exterior algebra, which kind of flips uh, the two, um, uh, uh, which flips graded pieces, um, the top graded piece goes to the bottom, et cetera. And, uh, and that duality should somehow um, turn joins into meets. And if you write that down carefully, um, this is actually what comes out, this, this formula. Um, so in some sense, that's what it's encoding. Um, uh, and this ensures that the support of um, the meet uh, of, two extent, of two extensors is the intersection of the supports of x and y. So it's not even clear that the that if you have an extensor here and an extensor here and you take their meat, you're going to get an extensor. But it's true that that it is, and that the um, and th the thing that you get is um, the extensor that that represents the supports of x and y, whose support is is right the intersection of the supports. Um, so the meat is kind of like trying to intersect two subspaces in the same sense as the join is like taking the span of two subspaces. And of course, once you've got the meet and the join, you can make a whole lattice and there's all sorts of post set um, wonderful mathematics that involves lattices and Rhoda, of course, when I was a combinatorialist with really broad interests, was interested in that post set and he wrote a lot about it and has really nice papers on it. Um, but I want us just to get a bit of practice with the meat. So let's let's give it some, let's try. Okay, so uh, let's practice with the meat and the join and it'll become clearer, okay? So uh, let's consider two lines, A, B, and C, D. So by A, B, I mean take uh, a point A and a point B and, and join them with a line and C, D similarly. And I'm gonna work in, I uh, said in P2, of course, I really want to work in the ambient vector space, uh, three-dimensional space, right? So I'm in a three-dimensional space. A is a three-dimensional vector. B is a three-dimensional vector. And, um, and I've got their join, which is um, uh, AB, which is A join B, which is a line, okay? Um, and I guess it's a line in projective space, but it's really a two-dimensional space in R3 space, right? Two-dimensional space in our ambient three space. So I've got these two 
um, two-dimensional spaces in our ambient gray space. And I'd like to try to understand what's their meat, right? Okay, well, of course, their meat should be this, this point, right? That, this point X. Um, so what I want to do is I want to express X, this intersection point. I want to express it as, as, a, as a vector on uh, the uh, two-dimensional space uh, spanned by C and D. So I'm going to express X as lambda C plus mu D, so lambda and mu are numbers. And C and D are vectors, right? I'm trying to express X as this union, as sorry, as this linear combination of these guys. And, um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to join AB to X. And on the left side, I get ABX, right? And ABX is, you know, the join of three vectors in three space is going to be a bracket, right? It's going to be the bracket to ABX. And ABX is zero because X lies on, on the line AB as well, right? So there's that dependency, so that's zero. Um, so there's the bracket ABX and it's zero. And on the other hand, when I join AB to this linear combination, I get lambda times ABC. And that uh, join of three vectors in three spaces a bracket, ABC, and plus mu times ABD. So what we get is that lambda times ABC plus mu times ABD has to be zero. And I can find lambda and mu just by observation, of course, is that, right? If lambda is ABD and mu is minus ABC, then, then I, get, I get zero, right? And in fact, any, any scaling of, those, of, of that pair will also give zero, right? But, um, but here, here's a pair that expresses uh, that's appropriate. So X is um, ABD, that's lambda coefficient times C, plus the mu coefficient, which is minus ABC times C. So X is, is given uh, as this linear combination of C and D. Um, so do the same argument um, with uh, AB and CD switched, and, and you get that X is also a linear combination of A and B, right? And it's got, turns out it's got these particular um, uh, coefficients, okay? And so that tells us that if you move everything to one side, um, you get this uh, nice uh, expression here. And, um, Not sure why I put this in red, except that um, what I'd like to do now is join this um, both vectors here, the, the vector complicated vector on the left hand side, and the vector zero on the right hand side with uh, AE, right? And what do we get? Um, well, I get AEC from here, I get AED from here, here I get AAE, and AAE is zero because I've got A repeated twice, right? And if you want to think A wedge A is zero already. Um, uh, so maybe this was red in order, in order to remind you that this thing drops out. And then uh, I get uh, AED uh, as the bracket here. And so we get this uh, expression. And this expression we've seen before, this is one of the Grassmann-Kluber relations, right? So um, the grassmann cayley algebra um, forces the definitions of the meet and join kind of encode the uh, Grassmann-Kluber relations as well, right? Using this kind of approach. Okay. Um, all right, here mostly we use the join. Let's see if we can uh, use the meet as well. Uh, not sure that I do. Well, we'll see. Um, so here's uh, another example. I've got three concurrent coincident lines. This will be useful to us later. So let's do this one. So I've got the line AB, I've got the line CD, and I've got the line EF, and they all meet in one point at X. And I'd like to try to understand what's the bracket condition that characterizes when I've got three lines like this that, that are coincident. Well, okay, we can write uh, X as before, 
as a linear combination of C and D keeping the same trick. And then we could join uh, X with EF, right? And when we join X with EF, you get, get this expression, EF with X, and then EF with C gives us this, and EF with D gives us this. And EFX is zero, so you get that ADD times EFC is equal to ADC times EFD. And this expression is getting characterized when uh, these three lines are coincident. The three lines are dependent for the group in, um, in P2. Right. Okay. Um, let's go back and, and try to see what we can understand about conics. Okay, so uh, suppose we had six points that lay on a conic. Um, then um, the conic that we're looking at, it's a member of what's called a pencil. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, uh, first um, I, I should explain what I mean by this uh, symbol, one, two, X. So one and two are the homogeneous coordinates for points one and two or of our six points. And X is the homogeneous coordinates for a general point x1, x2, x3, right, or x, y, z, if you wish, okay? Um, and of course, I could plug, uh, if I plug that into a bracket like this, um, when I expand out the bracket, it's like I've got a determinant here, and it becomes a linear function in uh, the coordinates of x, right? Um, these other two columns are fixed, they're, they're numbers. So this is a linear function, and I've got a different linear function here. And of course, if I multiply two linear functions, I get two lines, right? Um, uh, or at least their vanishing is, is, is defines two lines. And they define these two red lines. The red line that goes through points one and two, which is this guy, and the red line that goes through points three and four. Uh, so it's a particular conic that goes through all four points, one, two, three, and four. And I've drawn it a separate, um, set of lines, but somehow I've mislabeled them. Yeah, sorry about the picture. The picture should go from uh, go with one and three uh, uh, lines between one and three and two and four. Sorry about that, but uh, I've got a different set of lines here. Yeah, And it turns out that um, every conic through, uh, four, through these four points, one through four, um, how is a linear combination of these two conics. Um, and so that's what I mean when I say that it's a member of a pencil. A pencil consists of linear combinations of, of two things, in this case, two conics. Um, and so we could try to find these lambda and mu. And because uh, the conic that we're looking for, the one through, uh, that also goes through five and six, because it goes through x equals five, you can plug five into here and get zero. And that's going to um, tell you what lambda and mu are, just like before. So now we know what lambda and mu are, um, and they turn out to be these two um, uh, other brackets evaluated at five. So for instance, if I evaluate this at, at five, I get one, three, five, two, four, five, and it's the coefficient lambda. And the coefficient mu is this evaluated, uh, the red bracket evaluated at five, the negative sign, one, two, five, three, four, five, the negative sign. Okay, and, um, and then we want our conic to also go through six. So you plug x equals six in there, and you get that this polynomial has to vanish. And that's exactly the polynomial that we had um, here. Right, so, um, so you can recover a bunch of nice things um, using the meet and the join. Although I think I really only use the join here at this point. I don't use the meet very much. Um, so I might have to wait. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm going to speed up a little bit because I think some of you have already seen frameworks. Um, so let me just set some notation. So G is going to be a graph. 
going to refer to seats and edges, and P is going to represent a realization into n-dimensional space. Um, and uh, we're going to be interested in whether our graph admits non-trivial infinitesimal motions that preserve the edge lengths. So for each edge, we get this squared edge length, um, and uh, it's, it's given to us uh, from our realization. And I'd like to preserve this edge length, right? Um, so I'd like to find velocities, call them V, uh, velocities uh, of all the vertices um, uh, such that this length is preserved. Um, so one way to do that is to, is to um, um, take a linear motion here uh, of our vertex A, and a linear motion of our vertex B, and what I'd like is that the um, is that this distance between A and B should be the same, should, should continue, and so its derivative should be zero. And when you take the derivative and set uh, and set time equal to zero, we we want this condition to be true. So um, the, this is the uh, vector uh, difference between the positions of A and B, and these are the velocities of A and B, and they should be perpendicular just a key uh, requirement. Um, so, uh, so infinitesimal motions are uh, solutions to these equations. And uh, it turns out that these equations define for us a, um, a linear system. And so the Vs that we're looking at, the velocities that we're looking for are, are solutions to a particular linear system, a matrix times V is equal to zero. And the matrix depends, of course, on our graph and our positions of the vertices that we started with. And uh, the matrix is built in this way. I think we've seen this rigidity matrix many times before. It's It's got one row for each edge, and it's got uh, a column for each coordinate in a vertex. So um, we have n uh, coordinates for the vertex A, there's n coordinates for the position of vertex B, et cetera. And, and so I get n v uh, columns. And uh, row A, B is, uh, has entry P, A minus P, B. So this is really a vector, right? Uh, it's an n-dimensional vector. And so I've, I've written it as one item, but it's really n uh, components. And then P, B minus P, A in the, P, B, in the B columns, again, n entries here, and then zeros everywhere else. OK, and um, uh, this matrix, uh, we're interested in its kernel, right? We're interested in, in its solutions uh, to say m v equals 0. And um, it turns out that, uh, that the trivial or rigid motions, or rotations and translations, um, are always a solution to this. So this, this matrix always has, has a kernel, um, and the framework uh, is going to be said to have a non-trivial infinitesimal motion when um, the matrix uh, has more than this in its kernel. Um, that is, when its rank is less than the number of edges minus n plus 1 of the rule of choose 2. And that rank has to be, of course, bigger than 0. Otherwise, you don't really have anything in there. Um, so. Uh, I'm probably being a bit loose with um, questions about the framework. I'm assuming that it's a full framework, that its vertices span uh, n-dimensional space and things like that. But, um, but uh, maybe I can skip those details. Um, so uh, we say that a framework GP is infinitesimally rigid if its rank is equal to uh, to this uh, quantity. Um, and if G is at least n vertices in general position, so that's the fullness that we're talking about. Um, and for n equals 2 infinitesimal rigidity, so infinitesimal rigidity in the plane um, implies rigidity. Um, there's no non-rigid motions of G that preserve edge lengths in that situation. Um, but for n bigger than or equal to 3, um, infinitesimal rigidity is strictly stronger than rigidity. Um, and all of you, I think, probably know that uh, Fermat and earlier Paul Jack Geringer uh, 
shows that for n equals two, a generic realization of a graph that is infinitesimally rigid, the graph contains a two, three tight spanning subgraph. It is if the number of edges is twice v minus three for the graph, and if for every induced subgraph, we have the number of edges uh, on that induced subgraph is two times the number of vertices minus three or, or less. And we'll say that a graph is is isostatic if its generic realization is infinitesimally rigid, and also if the rows of uh, M are independent. So what we're requiring here is that the, the graph be generically uh, infinitesimally rigid. And our interest uh, in this week's talk is mainly in special positions of isostatic graphs. So which isostatic graphs, which graphs that are generically rigid actually have motions when the vertices are in very special positions, okay? And those special positions are, they're very special, but they're not dependent on the uh, coordinates that you use for your vector space. Um, so the, uh, so the existence of such special positions is an invariant. We're going to try to measure them. And the condition uh, that says that you have, um, uh, that your framework is in a special position where it has a motion when generically it doesn't have a motion is uh, called the pure condition. Excuse me a minute. It's called the pure condition. So um, whether an isostatic framework admits a non-trivial infinitesimal motion doesn't depend on their choice of coordinates, as I was just saying. So this is an invariant property. And there's a polynomial in the brackets then that's built using the locations of our vertices um, that vanishes when there's an infinitesimal motion. And so we'd like to be able to write down this polynomial and say, ah, if this polynomial vanishes, then um, you have an infinitesimal motion, that, uh, a non-trivial infinitesimal motion. And that polynomial is called the pure condition. Um, and I'm not totally sure why it's called the pure condition, but maybe only it, maybe it's called pure because it only involves the positions of the vertices. Have a look at that. Okay. So in order to compute the pure condition, we need to talk about what a tie down is. And I think we've seen this already in Mira's uh, talks um, when we talked about uh, uh, DR uh, plans, we have to sometimes tie down some of the vertices so that they don't move. Um, so to actually compute a pure condition, uh, we need to characterize when that rigidity matrix M has less than full rank. Um, and we're assuming that, um, that our uh, framework is um, uh, isostatic so that, um, so that in generic, generically, it's it's rigid, and we're assuming that that uh, e is n v minus n plus one over two. So we don't have enough uh, rows to make the matrix square. Um, we're missing n plus one choose two rows. Uh, so when n is three in the plane, we're missing three rows, and when uh, when we're working in in three space, we're missing six rows. Okay. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to um, just uh, add three or six rows to our matrix in order to make it a square matrix. We're going to do that in such a way that we don't change the rank of the matrix itself. Okay. So uh, it turns out that we can add rows to the matrix to make it square without affecting the linear independence of its rows. And we do this by adding fictitious edges. Um, a times ax, where a is, uh, is uh, a vertex, and x is like a new vertex that we're kind of tying down a to, and, um, and uh, so we call it a tie down. And if we choose um, the position of x to be the position of a minus um, ei, that's the standard basis vector, then it turns out that what we're adding is um, an identity matrix 
in the bottom left corner uh, and um, followed by a bunch of zeros. And um, we're not going to bother writing down columns for the tie down vertices in the rigidity matrix because we're going to assume that the, that the tie down vertices, the x's, that they don't move at all, right? Um, and this has the effect of removing all the rigid motions from our framework. Um, for instance, if we're in the plane, we, we're tying down one vertex with two, forcing it to connect up to, uh, to two vertices. Um, and that, that has the effect of essentially forcing that vertex to be zero, zero. And then um, the, the, another vertex, the third uh, tie down, we apply it to another vertex. And that has the effect of, of forcing it to uh, um, not be able to rotate. Um, you can kind of move it, slide it in a one-dimensional direction um, along uh, the line when it forms with uh, a zero, zero. So we could kind of force it to be, say, on the x-axis. Um, and that's what we did earlier, right? We've done these kinds of things before. Um, OK, so uh, we apply these tie downs. And now our matrix is square. Our rigidity matrix is square. And now we can um, compute its determinant. And its determinant should be um, should vanish precisely when um, the columns, original columns in the rigidity matrix uh, weren't independent. That is, that we had an infinitesimal, non-trivial infinitesimal motion. So, um, so that's great. So the augmented uh, matrix M has a square, and um, and we and uh, when its determinant vanishes, we get. Um, uh, we, we get the uh, pure condition holding, OK? And so what we'd like to do is write the pure condition, write this determinant of the square matrix as in terms of the brackets, right? And it can be written in terms of the brackets. We just have to find out how to do so. OK, um, and so um, let me show you an important trick. Um, I think this is a really beautiful trick. Uh, it comes up in my Calculus 3 class, but somehow I never really understood this trick to apply to rigidity um, until now. Um, but uh, suppose you've got a vertex A, and it's tied down to vertex X, and also tied down to vertex, tied down vertex Y. So then this determinant, um, this is, uh, I'm working in R2, so, so this is really a, a, a vector with two components in it and another vector and two components. So I could take the two by two determinant of this matrix. Um, and by this, I mean really the determinant of, of um, the difference, not of uh, vertices, but of their positions, right? Um, and uh, if you write their position as uh, position of A is A1, A2, um, and then one for, uh, if we're, I'm thinking of R2 as, as uh, point in projective space, uh, as a point in the finite projective plane. Well, and, yes. Uh, can I interrupt for a second? Sorry about that. Yeah. <clears throat> Is there a natural stopping point at uh, soon so yes. that we can, there you know? Is, and I'm kind of aiming for it now, but, uh, but, and so I think we should finish in the next two or three minutes. Oh, okay, sounds great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you yeah. for, for yeah. the uh, prompt. <laughs> okay. Um, so it turns out that this determinant um, is uh, that this two by two determinant is also a three by three. It has the same value as a three by three determinant. And um, this three by three determinant is uh, the determinant um, that we call the bracket before a, x, and y. Okay. And, um, and so this trick comes up um, again when we compute pure conditions. So let me just say, um, I'd like to get to say this and then uh, do the next example, and then that's it um, for today. So um, in a very nice paper in, in a Cyan journal, uh, White and Whiteley proved that after applying these tie downs, unless we do some tie downs that are so-called admissible, then um, the square determinant that we 
that we have. We've got the square rigidity matrix. And that determinant equals a polynomial uh, in uh, brackets that involves the tie down vertices and a polynomial, uh, another polynomial factor that doesn't involve the tie down vertices. And it turns out that this um, uh, polynomial factor, CG, um, not only doesn't it involve the tie down vertices, but it's independent of which choices of the tie down vertices you chose. And so it's, it's, um, it's an invariant of your graph. And, and this polynomial is precisely the pure condition that we were looking for. It's a very nice uh, fact. Let's see it in practice in this one example. So this is the simplest possible example. We're still working in R2 and we're looking at the triangle ABC as our framework. Okay, and, um, and so we're gonna tie down A to two spots and tie down B to a single spot, right? And here's our augmented rigidity matrix. It's got uh, two columns for A, two columns for B, and two columns for C. And we've got six edges here. Um, and I've got the first uh, edge here, AX, the tie down, and then AY, the tie down edge. And then I've got the edge AB, um, and then the tie down edge um, PZ, and then it's X. And you can see that this matrix is a very nice form, maybe too nice. Uh, to be uh, true in general, but the way we've ordered things, uh, this matrix is upper triangular, block upper triangular. And so its determinant is this two by two determinant, which using our trick is exactly AXY times this two by two determinant, which is ABZ, and then times this determinant, two by two determinant, which is ABC. You can see, these are the extraneous factors that involve the tie downs. And this red bracket is the pure condition. So the pure condition is the bracket ABC. And so what we're saying is that if you have a triangle ABC and if this bracket vanishes, then you get a non-trivial infinitesimal function. And what does it mean that this bracket vanishes? It means that A, B, and C are collinear. So you're in this kind of situation where your triangle is degenerate, and then it collinear, your infinitesimal motion moves C but leaves A and B fixed, right? Um, and that's kind of the classic first um, example of a pure condition. And this is a good place to stop. Next time I'll talk about um, more examples and, uh, and we'll get into uh, three dimensions. Uh, but this is this is great. We got we got uh, far enough today.